Canyon Ridge, what's up? Life is so much better when we're together. Our family has spent much of our time away on this sabbatical on a road trip to various national parks. Six people in one vehicle in the daytime and a tent at night for three weeks. I guarantee you, we are learning some things about being together. And as crazy and as challenging as it can be at times, it's also funny and encouraging and meaningful and sweet and awesome when we're together. It's just better. We believe that God has made us to live really well with others and other people are some of the best of what God brings into our lives. Good friends and family that we live deeply together with, good connections with people that make our lives interesting and exciting. For the next several weeks, we're gonna talk about how we can live really well in these relationships. Because even though they're awesome and we couldn't imagine our lives without them, the truth is we can all get better at living well with others. So today, Mitch is gonna get us started. We're gonna look at a letter written to people following Jesus about how to live really well together. Each week, we'll talk about a different value from Colossians 3, that if we live by this, our relationships will definitely get better. We're all gonna do life with someone. Let's lean into what God has said about how to be really great at being together. Well, when I was a kid, we had a swimming pool in our backyard. Now, before you are too impressed, it was not one of these fancy built-in swimming pools like the other kids had. We had this little patio swimming pool out on our back patio there. It was about two feet deep, and it wasn't even one of these ones that are inflatable like they are today. You know, this was made out of a piece of like rolled corrugated steel in a ring that had this plastic liner on the inside. It was amazing. We didn't like saw an arm off getting in and out of this thing, right? But that was our swimming pool and we liked it. And we uh, had neighborhood friends that would come over and they, we'd all jump in the pool and be splashing around. And inevitably, this always happened. Somebody, might have been me, not important, somebody... <laughs> would start running around the inside of the pool and start to kind of spin the water around this pool. And then I'd get my brother and try to get everybody else involved in this. And we would start running around the inside of this pool trying to churn up the current and make a whirlpool in our little pool, right? And maybe you've done this, you know, we'd all get up and we'd run and we'd try to make the water spin and it kind of get going and everybody would join in and we all go running around this pool and Pretty soon, somebody would fall down, and they would start realize that they could just ride the current of this water around the pool, right? And then uh, we'd run some more. We'd say, come on, help us. And we'd run more, and we'd get the water really going. And then we'd all kind of sit down and ride the current around this pool for a while. Well, we would go on doing that for some time. You know, you know what would happen, right? I mean, we're kids, so we'd all get kind of worn out. We'd all get tired. And We'd all sit down and try to ride the current for a while, and eventually the water would just get still again, and we'd be kind of bored, so we'd all get out and go home. Well, from that, I learned something about how people work together. That in any group, in any family, in any marriage, in any relationship, in any organization, in any church, in any business, even in any country, there is a current that is generated by the behavior of the people that are in the pool, right? I mean, there is a current that you can feel, and if you jump into that pool along the way, you could immediately start feeling the pull of this current that is generated by the way people behave when they are together in that relationship. It's created by their behavior, by the way that they're running and spinning the water. And you can walk into any place and feel the current of that, can't you? I mean, it's why you walk into Chick-fil-A and go, something different is going on in here that's different from other fast food establishments that I have been into. You're like, why is everybody so like, polite in here all of a sudden, right? Or you walk through the gates of Disneyland and start going, hey, this, this kind of is the happiest place on earth. You know, even though the kid is screaming about, why do we have to go on? It's a small world. And I'm saying, because your mother wants to go on that. That might be our family. Not important, right? But we get, we get this sense that there is this different current, this flow. You can feel it. 
I mean, all you got to do is go over to the house of those new friends that you made and have dinner with them at their house. And it doesn't take very long before you start to feel how their water is spinning in their house, right? The current that is created by the behavior of the people that are in that relationships. We create a current by the way we behave. Our behavior in our relationship creates an effect that other people experience in our pool. And that's how relationships work, right? And the good news is that we don't have to be victims of the current, that we can learn better behavior. We can learn new things to do in our relationships that actually will start spinning the water in a different direction so that we can have a better experience in our relationships. We can get better at relating. And that's good news because we know that so much of our peace and our joy, so much of our fulfillment in life rises and falls on the quality of the relationships that we're having, right? I mean, everything else can be going really good, but if that relationship is not working right, if, the, if our relationship at work isn't going right, it really takes some of the shine off of the rest of the joy we're having in our life. It's important how relationships are going with us, and we, we can learn how to do them really well so we can enjoy the best that God has for us in those relationships. But here's what we need to know right? That what we do in our relationships, the way that we behave in our relationships has everything to do with our values because our, it's our values that drive our behavior. Let me explain how this works. This past year, something happened to me and I found myself with a brand new set of values that I never had before in my life. And I started behaving in ways that I had never behaved before. I started doing things that I had never done before because something had become important to me that was never important before. And I would find myself on a random weeknight driving down to the strip and spending $35 for parking that used to be free also, I could go and stand outside an arena, not inside with the people that got tickets, mind you, but outside an arena with 2,000 of my new best friends cheering at a screen where guys were chasing around a little black disc that I couldn't even see. <laughs> our values drive our behavior. What is important to us turns into the way that we behave. And when the right values drive our behavior and our relationships, our relationships will get better. And that's why in this series, we're going to be looking at the book of Colossians chapter 3. Maybe you can just start reading the book of Colossians. It'd be great for you to do. and Just get familiar with what the Apostle Paul is teaching here. And we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 3 specifically is we look at a, a unique value each week that we can begin to adopt and embrace in our life that will begin to change the way that we behave in our relationships so that we can learn to relate to people really well and we can do life really well together. Because here's the truth. We all have relationships that could be better. And if they're sitting by you, eyes forward, okay? Just eyes forward right now, right? <laughs> We all have relationships that could be better. We have those relationships that were going along so good and something happened in the midst of that. And from that point on, it has been strained. And every time we're together with that person, I mean, we have a good time and all, and we have great fun and all, but there's that thing hanging there in the middle of the relationship that we just can't seem to get past. And we know the relationship isn't ever going to grow very far down the road because it's anchored to that thing that strained the relationship. Or maybe we have the relationship that's just kind of stuck. You know that we just find ourselves kind of butting heads over and over again with that person over the same issues. You know, parents wonder why, you know, as a 10-year-old kid, we had such a sweet relationship. We had such a great relationship when my kids were young. But now that they've turned into teenagers, man, something has happened. And all we seem to do is butt heads and argue, and there's tension all the time. What 
happen to that? And are we ever going to be able to get past that so when those kids grow up and become adults, we can have the kind of relationships that we always hoped that we could have with our kids as adults? Or maybe relationships have just kind of grown superficial. Relationships that at one time were really important to us and really mattered, and there was some depth and some closeness in those relationships. But somewhere along the way, they've just grown distant. They've just grown superficial. And now it's become kind of a, hi, how you doing? And we just kind of go on our way. You see, we wish there was more joy. We wish there was more peace. We see those people coming and thinking, man, this could be better. And we start to get a sense of the gap, right? We can, we can see what the relationship could be, but, we, but we're living in the reality of what it is. And as much as we wish we could have what it could be, we can't seem to get past where we are with it right now and we feel this gap. And when that happens, we start to do something that's incredibly dangerous. We start to consider what might need to happen to take that relationship from here to there. Let me tell you why that's dangerous. Because we'll start coming up with ideas of things that we could do to help the relationship to be better. But eventually, eventually, there's really only one answer, and we know it, right? That something, someone, is going to have to change. Right, if this relationship is gonna get any better, Someone is going to have to grow. Someone is going to have to change. Someone is going to have to have a change of mind and a change of values so that this relationship can go from where it is to where it possibly could be. And we are all pretty sure who that person is. (laughs) Right? Let's say it together. It's them. Right? I mean, come on. It's them. Me, what are you talking about? Come on, you know what? I've been a pastor for a long time. And I have never had anybody show up in my office and go, you know what? It's totally me. It's, they're great. They're awesome. They got it all together. There's nothing wrong with them. I am the one who's totally screwing this whole thing up. Right? Nobody has ever said that, right? I've never said that either, by the way. <laughs> but, but in our more sane moments, we do understand that we're the only ones that we can do anything about here, right? That we're the only ones whose behavior we can control. We're the only ones whose values we can change. And if the relationship is going to get better, it's going to get better probably because I make a change. And it's at that point that we ask a question that will determine what's really going to happen with this relationship. We ask the question, Is this really worth it, right? I mean, when we consider what is going to have to happen to get our relationship from here to there, and we realize that it's me that's going to have to do some soul searching, that I am going to have to do some self-evaluating, I may need to correct some habits or some ways of behaving, I may need to have a very uncomfortable conversation. We start to do a little cost-benefit analysis, a little relational math, right, to determine whether or not it's going to be worth it. Am I willing to pay the price of change, of the pain it will take to change so this relationship has a chance to get better? And this is why we're stuck. This is why our relationships get caught in this endless loop of the same thing over and over again. Why those relationships never seem to move past that thing that happened. Why it feels like Groundhog Day every day in our relationships, right? Because we hear what should happen. We see what could happen. And we ask ourselves, is it really worth it? tough part about it is it's a values change, right? I mean, if we believe what we just said about our values driving our behavior, this is no small thing. Something is going to have to matter that doesn't matter as much now. Something is gonna have to mean something to me that doesn't mean that much right now. And my values are gonna have to change if my behavior is gonna change, if this relationship is gonna change. 
And I start having to wonder, what do I want more? Do I want comfort? Do I just want the status quo? Do I just want my way? Or do I really want progress? See, that's why we're starting uh, this series where we are, talking about embracing change. This value of embracing transformation and real change in our life, not running from it, not resisting change that needs to come, not getting to the moments where I know that something needs to change in me and backing away from him, but embracing those moments of real life change so that we get better in our relationships get better. And the reason we're starting here is because if we don't embrace this value of change in our relationships, then what we're going to do is we're going to listen to these next few weeks of messages and go, wow, that sounds like a great idea. And wow, that would be really great to do in that relationship. And wow, that probably would really fix things. And then we'll go home and do the relational math and conclude that it's just not worth it. Let's not bother. Now, I realize I'm pushing you, right? And I'm kind of up in your business right now, aren't I? But I'm going to push you even harder. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a person who has said, I want to follow Jesus' way of doing life. I want to live with him as the Lord, the guide, the boss of my life. And I want to live my life his way. Then you don't get the option of saying it doesn't matter. There is something that is so foundational to our faith. There is a truth that is so fundamental to what we believe as Christians, as followers of Jesus, that does not give us the option to say it's too much trouble. I'm not gonna bother. And the Apostle Paul points to it in the first chapter of this book of Colossians as he's trying to get these Christians, these followers of Jesus, ready to hear some teaching about how they can change their values. And this is what he says. He says, this same good news that came to you is going uh, all over the world, and it's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives just as it changed your life from from the day you first heard it and understood the truth about God's grace. And what he's saying here is, guys, this truth of the good news of Jesus has transformed your life. It's changed your perspective. It's given you a new framework for understanding what's important in life and what's not. It's given you a filter through which you can see the world and see the issues of the world and adjust your filter so you can see them in the way that God does. This good news has transformed your life. And he's And we ask, well, what was the good news? What was this message that was so transformational, it was so compelling, it was so life-defining that it changed everything about their life? This was the good news. The good news was you matter to God. You matter to God. Now, that may not sound like very big news to us, right? But to them... It was huge. And the reason it doesn't sound like such huge transformational, life-changing news to us is because we have lived under the umbrella of this value from the birth of our country. I mean, we live in a culture that's already been informed by this value. I mean, there's things that we do that we don't even think about anymore because of this value. We live in the idea that there are truths that we hold self-evident, that everyone has been created by God and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. I mean, we have this in, already infused in our culture. And we do simple things like stand in line and wait our turn and let somebody else go first because of this value. We do things like take care of our elderly and value the lives of our children and take care of people and expect others to take care of people who aren't able to take care of themselves. We do that because we have already been informed by this value that people matter to God. But in the culture that Jesus was speaking, the people that the Apostle Paul was talking to, it wasn't that way. They didn't live with that particular value. In fact, the gods did not love you. You were just kind of a pawn of the gods, and they kind of played with you for their own amusement, 
right? And it was a reflection of this culture where very powerful people considered themselves gods, considered themselves the rulers of the world. And people were just pawns to them. They were expendable to them. They were disposable to them. It was a culture in which women didn't matter much. Women couldn't earn an income. Women couldn't hold down a job. They couldn't own property. And they were completely dependent upon being attached to a good man who wouldn't for some reason or just some wild hair idea put them away uh, in divorce for any reason they wanted to come up with. And they were completely dependent on that man providing for them and taking care of them. And if that guy decided to put them out into the street or if he met some kind of untimely death, women found themselves at a level of life that led them to either destitution and maybe even prostitution just to get by. Children didn't matter very much in this culture. In fact, they mattered very little. It was a common practice that they might, a family might not even name their children until they could figure out if their child was going to have enough capability to produce and help the family and not become a liability to the family. So if children were born and they had some kind of deformity, which many of them did, or some kind of deficiency that didn't let them help and contribute to the family, they would just put the children out into the streets. And there's some scholars that believe that, you know, that story in the New Testament where these children come running up to Jesus, you know, and the disciples try to shoo them away. And Jesus says, hey, let these kids come to me. Let the little children come to me for such is the kingdom of heaven. It were these kind of children that they were talking about, these street children that had been put out by their families that were running up to see this man who seemed to love them and treat them with value. It was into that kind of culture that Jesus would step and say, you matter to God so much that he sent his only son to die so that he could have a relationship with you. And all of a sudden, your value was not calculated because of the color of your skin. You didn't have to be of a certain social class or a certain gender to have value. Your ability to produce wasn't the measure of your worth. You mattered because you mattered to God, and it was revolutionizing the world, and it was changing everything. It became so attractive. This group of people that were calling themselves Christians that adhered to this value was so attractive that people were willing to risk their lives to join them, all because these people treated them with value that came from God. That was the good news of the gospel that was changing everything. And the Apostle Paul knew that if these Colossian people could just fully understand how God saw them and how God saw the world and how God saw what was important in the world, that they would eventually behave correctly in their relationships. And that's why Paul would write this. He said, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will. <clears throat> and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. In other words, we have not stopped praying that God would help you see things the way he sees things and understand completely how God views you and how God views the world and how God views others. Because when you do that, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. This past uh, spring, I was in Bolivia. Got to be there with a team of people from our church here, going down to visit some kids that uh, maybe many of you are sponsoring, that the people of Canyon Ridge at all of our campuses are banding together to help build churches in Bolivia that we could then put a compassion project in for children and families. And we went down to visit one of these churches and we're in uh, visiting the, the project that was happening there, the compassion project that was happening. And we got to sit in a class that was called the Child Survival Class, the Child Survival Program. And it does exactly what it sounds like it does. That this amazing, beautiful teacher from Compassion Bolivia was teaching these three mothers and their young children 
how to take care of themselves so that they literally would help their children to survive a very difficult culture and very di difficult circumstances. And we sat there, and I got to watch as this Compassion Bolivia worker taught these women how to wash their hands and explain to them that they needed to get their fingers together and wash all of their hands so that germs wouldn't collect on their hands. And if they touched their food, then those germs would be ingested. And eventually, those germs would make them sick and could potentially kill them. And they should teach their children how to wash their hands too. And they showed their kids how to wash their hands so that the kids wouldn't get germs that could potentially kill them. And as fascinating as it was and as mind-blowing as it was to watch a person teach other women how to wash their hands, the more amazing thing was when she started explaining why. Because she started saying to them, you wash your hands and you care for your bodies because they belong to God. And you are a unique creation of God and he loves you and cares about you so you are to take care of yourself because you matter to God and you are to teach it to your children because their bodies belong to God and because they matter to God and you are, they are to take care of themselves because they are valuable to their heavenly father. Man, I sat there in that class with a knot in my throat thinking Jesus changes everything. His good news that we matter changes everything about the way we treat ourselves and the way we treat and view other people. And it's at this point that the lights really come on for us, right? That we begin to understand that if we matter to God like that, then everybody matters to God like that. And it begins to change the orientation of our belief system, doesn't it? From one that is exclusively vertical to one that is intentionally and intentionally horizontal. That means that it no longer just matters how we're doing with God. It's not just between us and God anymore in the vertical. Now all of a sudden, it really matters how we are doing in our relationships between you and me. Now all of a sudden, our spiritual maturity is measured no longer just by how many spiritual rituals we do or how much we pray or how much we go to certain ceremonies or practice certain religious practices. That our spiritual maturity now is defined by how well we love one another and how, well we how much we have the capacity to treat others like God has treated us. That's why Jesus would say things like, look, I'm going to give you a new command. Here's the new command. Love one another like I have loved you. This is how they will know you are my disciples. Not by how much you know, not by how many church services you go to, not by how many Bible verses you can quote. This is how you'll know. They'll know that you are my disciples by the way that they love one another. All of a sudden, no longer can we assume that we are right with God if we are not right with our neighbor. And I understand why. Because one day, I was driving over across town to pick up my eighth grade son, my oldest son, from school. And as I, he's 20 years old now, so this is a while ago, right? But he was in eighth grade. I drove up to the school, and as I started walking over towards where I knew he would be. I could see him, and I could see a couple of kids standing there picking on him. Now, what you need to know about my oldest son is that he is mildly autistic. Now, just enough to make him, like, really interesting and really smart, okay? <laughs> but he's mildly autistic. And these kids thought it was okay to pick on him. We're poking at him and jabbing at him and making fun, and I could tell. And as I was walking up, to where my son and these kids were, I was doing everything I could do to not commit a felony, right? <laughs> so I walked up to these kids and I put my hand on the shoulder of one of them and I said, hey, that is my son. And when I said that, this kid goes, oh, hey man, hey, it's cool. Hey, it's all right. Hey man, we're cool, we're good, hey, it's cool. And I said to him, bud, it's not cool. 
And it's not going to be cool until you start treating my son with the same value that I have for him. It's not going to be cool. And you and I are not good. And the only way we're going to be good is if you start valuing him like I value him. You see, it's why the apostle John would write, you can't say you love God and hate your brother. If you say that, you're a liar and the love of God is not in you. So when we get to these moments in our relationship where we go, you know, this really needs to be better. And we start to calculate up the cost of what it's going to take to make them better. And we conclude, I am going to have to change some values, some behaviors. I'm going to have to care about some things that I didn't care about before. And as we start doing the relational math on that equation and start coming to conclusions, if you are a follower of Jesus, you do not get to conclude that it doesn't matter because to God, they matter a lot. See, I think we've had it wrong for a long time. We were so much about how God feels about us and very little about how we feel about others. The reason that we don't get to say it's not worth it is because they are worth it. And when we get to that moment when we realize that for a relationship to change, I'm going to have to change, it's at that moment that we need to embrace change. Paul would say it this way. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, since you have this new life that is full of the value of God, that you have this new perspective on life that you matter to the creator of everything, set your sights on the realities of heaven. In other words, see things the way heaven sees them. See the realities that heaven sees. The realities that not only do you matter, but that everybody matters. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. As you are deciding how you're going to treat the people in your relationships, the people in your family, the people that are around you, think about the things of heaven, the things that are important to heaven, the party line of heaven, not the party line of your party, not the party line of the blog you've been reading, not the party line of the news station you happen to like. Think about the things of heaven when you decide how you're going to treat others, not the things of this earth. Why? Because you died to that stuff. You died to that life. And your real life, real relationship, real life, real fulfillment, real joy, real fullness, your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Now listen, I cannot guarantee, I wish I could, but I cannot guarantee that if you do this, if you begin to embrace some new values as we talk about them and try to live differently into these relationships, I can't guarantee that your relationships will get better. I think they have a better chance of doing that, right? But we can't guarantee it. They might not. But I will guarantee this, that you will get better. You will get better. And if and if it's only for that, if it's only so that your life starts to change and your values start to change and you begin to more live out this value that you matter and that other people matter, if it's only for you, it's worth it to embrace that change because you matter to God too. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to you 
that though there are billions of people on this planet, somehow you know our name. Somehow you care deeply about all of our stuff and all that we're going through. And Father, we struggle so much sometimes to feel our own sense of value that sometimes it's very difficult to give that away to others. But God, we're grateful that we matter to you. Enough that you would send your son to die so that you could have a great relationship with us. And Father, I pray that you would help us. God, to begin to change our perspective, to let that news change our perspective. So that every eye we look into this week, starting with those that are closest to us, God, every eye we would look into and we would think they matter to God. The parents would see their children not as those who are creating the hassle, but as those who matter to you. Husbands would see their wives. Wives would see their husbands. Friends would see their friends. Co-workers would see their co-workers and their bosses as those that matter to you. And that, God, you would help us begin to live with that new perspective and let that new value change and shape the way that we behave so that we can have the kind of relationships that you imagined for us to have, full and rich and sweet and good. God, give us courage to step through those moments where we want to say it's not worth it and that we would change our value and make it worth it because they are worth it and so are we. God, help us to that end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week this week.